We're in Romans chapter 9. Remember, the principal question here is after having shown us the gospel of how we are saved through Romans 1 through 8 and all the wonderful, marvelous things of that, Paul's question is, what about the Jews? If this is the great thing and Jesus is from the Jews and he came to save his people, has God been unfaithful since to, to his promises since, after all, most of the Jewish race was not saved? Some were. Paul was a Jew, of course as were Peter, John, James, and others. But most of the Jewish nation rejected Christ. Paul's big question is, well, is God then unfaithful to his promises to save his people if indeed these, most of these have rejected Christ and are not saved? He's from the Jews. Well, so he then begins Romans chapter 9, saying three with three emphatic, I'm telling the truth statements, uh, that I wish, even if I could, I would be willing, he says, to be cut off from Christ, basically condemned to hell eternally, if only I could save the Jewish race. His heart was to save the Jews, that they would believe in their Savior. And he says, you know, they have all these great things. They're Israelites. They have the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises the patriarchs and of their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, be blessed forever. Blessed forever. So he says, all these things they have, and yet they're not saved, but it is not as though the word of God had failed. That's his main point, isn't it? God's word to the Jews, I mean to God, to, to Abraham's children, has not failed. How so? If most of them are not saved. We read on. But it is not as though the word of God had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham, because they are his descendants. But through Isaac shall your descendants be named. So he quotes the Old Testament. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I'll return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man and our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the elder will serve the younger, as it's written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Okay? So, what is his main point here? Let's take a look at my questions here. Has God not kept his word of promise to Israel to save Abraham's children? What's the answer? Yes. God has kept his word. Yes. So Paul here is being a defender, if you will, of God. Not that God needs a defender. But just like in the Old Testament, I forget which one it was. Was it the Elihu? Which one defended God in the days of Job? The three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, all spoke poorly and misrepresented God. Was it Elihu was the last one? He spoke on behalf of God. God didn't just that God didn't condemn him. He actually stood and defended the Lord. I believe. I think that's right. Well, here Paul is defending the Lord's trustworthiness, his honor, his faithfulness to his word to keep it. And indeed, um, God has kept his word to save Israel, to save Abraham's children. Amen? Amen? Yes, he does. But Paul's point is, well, how is that true if most of the Jews are not saved? Answer, it depends on what Abraham's children means. Right? It depends who did God promise to save. All of his physical descendants or his spiritual children? Spiritual. spiritual children. Has God saved all of Abraham's seed, those who are reckoned as children of Abraham? Indeed he has. God's entirely kept his word of promise to do so. It's not as word, though the word of God had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, not all are children of Abraham, because they are his descendants. Okay, so uh, 
Do we see this throughout the scriptures? That indeed, well, let's look at question number four here. Who are Abraham's children? Well, let's read on a little more. He says, but through Isaac shall your descendants be named. Hmm. That means, he says, this means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned as descendants. Yeah. Who might he relate also? So Isaac was one of the chosen, a descendant of Abraham, a physical seed, and yet he was saved. Who was Isaac's brother? Ishmael. Ishmael, who was not, well, not an inheritor of the promises. Doesn't mean he wasn't saved eternally, but he wasn't an inheritor of the Abrahamic promises. Right? Mm -hmm. Though he was of the seed of Abraham. So he was physically a seed of Abraham, but he was not of the chosen line of the promise of Abraham going to the Christ. That was through Isaac shall your descendants be named. So Paul is saying, let's, let's understand. God's been faithful to keep his word to Israel, but let's understand who Israel is, who are Abraham's true children, the children of the promise, who are going to be elected to such, chosen by grace, and who believe as Abraham believed. As Paul uh, pulling strings going too far here, uh, extending himself out of the limb too far to interpret it this way, this is what all of Scripture says, isn't it? Look at what uh, Jesus says, for example, in John chapter 8, if you want to turn there for a minute. Or you can just listen. Look at how he contends with the physical seed of Abraham. Jesus 31. Let's go from 31 on. Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham. There's the point, right? Physical seed. And have never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will be made free? <clears throat> Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, truly, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave doesn't continue in the house forever, the son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, physically in other words, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Is Jesus going to make a distinction here between physical seed and real children of Abraham? Yes. I speak of what I've seen with my father and you do what you've heard from your father. Mm. Okay. Oh, what? They said, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Notice, we have physical lineage to him. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do what Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who told you the truth which I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You do what your father did. In other words, you get a different father. You're claiming Abraham is your father. If he's your father, then you should do what he did, which was love me. But because you're doing the opposite and trying to kill me, you're showing you are not Abraham's children, though you are fleshly. He just said, I know you're descendants of Abraham physically, but you're not Abraham's children spiritually, because you're following, he's going to say, the devil. Mm -hmm. You and your father did. They said, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. <laughs> Right. Uh, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded and came forth from God. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, and here he lets it fly. Fly where what he's really saying? You're of your father, the devil, he says, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks to according to his own nature and he's a, because he's a liar, for he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God, hears the words of God. 
The reason why you do not hear them is that you're not of God. Notice that. Jesus makes this distinction very clearly, the same thing as Paul says, right? Being a physical descendant of Abraham does not save you. It's being a spiritual child of Abraham that saves you. And how do you get to be a spiritual child of Abraham? When you do what Abraham did. And what did Abraham do? Believe. He believed in the promise. He believed in God. And he loved Christ. Because if God were your father, Jesus says, you'd love me. Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day, says Jesus. He saw it and was glad. But you're not glad because you're children of the devil. So notice there's a distinction here very clearly drawn. They can be a physical seed of Abraham, and yet not the spiritual seed that God was after uh, in terms of his promise to save all Abraham's children. Okay? So you hear other things like that. I mean, John the Baptist does the same thing too, doesn't he? You know, uh, do not seek to say, uh, you know, claim Abraham as your father, whatever he says there. He says, for God is able for these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Don't rely on your pedigree, your uh, natural lineage. It's faith that saves, not just being born of a physical blood. Remember, John chapter 1 says, He came to his own home, his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So being born of blood means physical lineage. That's not going to save you. It's being born of God by the Spirit. Being born again in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. That's what saves you. And you're saved through faith in Him. It's God electing you, as He's going to say here. By grace. So the whole point here is, 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 uh, is God being faithful? Yes, He is. Who are Abraham's children? Spiritual children? Example he brings up is, look, Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was the chosen, not Ishmael. They're both children, but only one was of the promise. And only one was going to inherit. Right? And only one was 100% the work of God. Say again, I'm sorry. And only one was 100% the power of God. Yeah, that's right. Only one was the 100% work of God. The other was born of natural means, the other of supernatural. Oh, i got to go back. I was like, where's Romans? Okay, John chapter... Eight there still. And there's other places we could look in Scripture for this. Paul already made this point in Romans chapter 4 that the children of Abraham are those who believe as Abraham believed. That's Romans chapter 4, which we covered in a previous comment on this book. Preaching. Okay, let's go on. Verse 8. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of of the promise are reckoned as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return and Sarah shall have a son. So there was a promise and that was through, uh, that was the promise of Isaac. 100% by God's foreordained grace, election, choice, power. And not only so, in other words, let's bring up another Old Testament example. But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told the elder will serve the younger. As it's written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Main point here is once again, not everybody who is descended from Isaac is... <laughs> a child of Abraham because we have Jacob and Esau both were blood of Abraham but only one was chosen and through whom the line of the Christ would come and would inherit the promises and the other would not inherit in fact remember Jacob stole <laughs> the inheritance from his brother, and it says the birthright and the pottage as well. But he also stole by remember we get in the hairy chest and <laughs> over over him and all that stuff. But it was also it was God's. It was not because he did those things, but because of God's election before they were born that God chose. But the main point here is that they're both seeds of Abraham. They're both blood. But God is faithful to His promises because here we have yet another example from the Old Testament patriarchs 
that you can be of the blood, but not of the inheritance. But you can be, also, if you're of grace chosen, you can be uh, an inheritor. So you have Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Both physically of Abraham, only one of the Abrahamic promise, and the other not. Okay, so God's faithful to his promises to Israel is the main point. It's just a question of who's Israel? Who are the real Jews here? Who are, I mean, who are the real people of God? Who are the children of Abraham? Those chosen by great hand. Um, how would you, uh, you may, I think you said it, but uh, when he says that Esau hated, obviously he doesn't hate him. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. Is, what is the inter great, interpretation? That's a great point. Great point, yeah. Hate there means not chosen, basically. Okay. I mean, it's just like when Jesus says, um, if you want to come to me and you don't hate your own father and mother, you can't be my disciple. That doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to have a whole bunch of Christians who dishonor their parents and who scheme against them to destroy them or something like that and hate them with a passionate hatred. You know, if you even say raka to your brother, you're liable to the council and the hellfire, right? In Matthew chapter 5. So obviously Jesus doesn't want you to hate your parents, but he, does, he wants, doesn't want you to choose them over him. Jesus says, uh, if anybody comes to me and doesn't hate his own father or mother, he, he's not worthy of me. In other words, I've got to be number one in your heart. You can't love your father or your mother more than me. <clears throat> so it's a matter of choosing. In that sense, that's what the hate means. You know, um, not if one is chosen, one's not chosen. And in the same way that we want to um, uh, choose God, you know, you've got to hate your own life. Does that mean you're like you totally just hate? yourself, hate everything about, but you choose God as, as your king, not your own self on the throne. God's on the throne. We give up our lives to serve him and follow what he says, not what our own mind and intellect or passions or sinful desires want to do. We've got to mortify ourselves, bury ourselves in baptism, which is what God does for us, be raised to a new life with a new king and Jesus on the throne, Jesus on our heart, Jesus number one. That's what it means. There. So, so they were chosen by grace before they'd done anything good or bad that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call. So, by grace, we are elected unto salvation. That's a work of God to save us. Um, so, he's going to make that point more, but the and the chapter is coming up, but the main point here, of course, again, is that uh, some Jews are of God, some are not of God. Okay? Alright, and uh, chosen by grace. So, before the death of God, what shall we say then? Verse 14. Is there injustice on God's part? No. By no means. So he's defending God once again. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not upon man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth, so that he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens the heart of whomever he wills. God is saying God, I'm sorry, Paul is saying that God is under no obligation. He's not beholden to any man to do what but, uh, we say he should do. He can do whatever he wants, with whomever he wants, whatever he wants. As our own Lutheran confessions say, at one point, God gives the Holy Spirit to whomever he wills, whatever he wills. So, um, are we going to charge God with injustice for electing Jacob and not choosing Esau. No, he can do whatever he wants with what he makes. Now the purpose here in these pas this passage, I believe, is to talk about, number one, defending God in terms of saving the spiritual children of Abraham, but it's also the lineage of the promise of the Christ through whom it would come. Uh, in the commentaries I've read, Lutheran LCMS ones like Kretzmann, this doesn't say that God chose Esau for damnation before he was born to be double predestined. In other words, to choose and make sure that he can never be saved eternally 
it means he was not chosen for the Abrahamic promise that the line was coming through uh, of the Christ and the inheritance. So it's not like uh, Esau was prevented before birth from ever having the opportunity or chance or whatever to believe and be saved. He may, might have believed and been saved, but he's not in accordance with the lineage of the promise of the inheritance that came through Abraham with respect to the, the Christ and the lineage. All right. And, and the hardening of God, a hardening of hearts by God is a very interesting deep subject, isn't it? Sometimes you hear of Pharaoh, which we're looking at here, that he hardened his own heart. In other places, God hardened his heart. Who started it? <laughs> right? Um, God raised him up for the very purpose of showing his power. But he hardened his heart in order to then show his might on, against Pharaoh and his wrath and his power. Boy, these lights are bright, aren't they? Whew. I'm just like getting dazzled here. <laughs> These things that you can't see. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That hardening of the heart, either by us or by God, yeah. that comes after our rejection up in the right. I believe mind. it does, yes. Not at the beginning of time. Not from free in the in as Calvin would say, like John Calvin would say, in the secret counsels of God, before the foundation of the world, before he made anything, he predestined most of the world to be damned and just be fuel for his fires. Whereas he only sent Christ to die for the elect and only to ever save a few. We deny that as Lutherans, double predestination. Yeah. So, and, the, um, so the hardening is after rejection. I believe so, yeah. Um, although God, of course, foresees that and he even predetermined, that's okay, you can leave it, sorry, I'll do it. Uh, pre, um, Acts chapter four, I think it is, where the apostles are saying, uh, that the, wow, that's weird. You know you're going to totally psych me out. It's like a drug trip now. <laughs> no, I've never had drugs, but I imagine this is what it would be like. <laughs> okay. You got me in. I did have some oxycodone once when I was had a kidney stone or some oxy something or other. I was a little, <laughs> but, uh, oh, did you just change the color again? It just changed. I, I put it back to where it was. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't see what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, focus, focus, horses, frame them in. That's all focus. you know. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Where was it? Okay, with the hardening of hearts. Oh, Calvin. Okay, well, when Luther was talking about the hardening of hearts, he said, like, Pharaoh was already wicked, but God was restraining it. And when God wanted to harden Pharaoh's heart, heart Pharaoh's hardening his own heart at the same time too, all God has to do is just withdraw himself from Pharaoh and let Pharaoh be Pharaoh. He let him go into what already his sinful heart was. It's almost as if Pharaoh is already an, an iced, um, frozen lake, but God threw a little bit of heat on him, prevented it from getting hardened, and then all God has to do is the sun is just withdraw himself and hide himself behind a cloud, and he just cakes over and ices himself. So God withdraws that by means of therefore hardening his heart and Pharaoh. So God hardens him and Pharaoh hardens him. But God hardens people's hearts at different times, and interestingly enough, if you want to say that this is double predestination, which is damned before the, you're damned to never be able to believe from the foundation of the world before the foundation of the world, as John Calvin would say. That's interesting. You might take this passage and say that, but very interestingly, if you read for chapters 10 and 11, the Jews whom God did harden and did not choose, they have the possibility of being saved in Romans 11. Isn't that interesting? So they're not hardened unto damnation eternally. They're hardened for a time. And if they don't persist in their unbelief, God can draft, draft them back into their own tree. And even the elect, who do get saved by grace and were saved because they were elect and saved by grace and elected, Paul has a warning for them. He says, if you become proud and look down on the Jews that have been broken off from the tree, you stand fast 
Only through faith, you can be broken off after having been elected and grafted in. So that's interesting, isn't it? The deep things of this. But the hardening here, therefore, cannot be a double predestination unto damnation eternally from before the foundation of the world, not allowing people to be saved, because in Romans 11, they were hardened so that the gospel will go out to the Gentiles, so that when the Gentiles get their blessings, Israel, who were hardened, might then see the blessings given to Gentiles and say, those are ours, become jealous, and they then won't want to get saved. These are deep things, aren't they? But the hardening then can't be unto eternal damnation from before the foundation of the world because in the next chapter, the hardened people, if they don't persist in their unbelief, can be grafted in. Actually, two chapters later, Romans 11. So, trying to make it simple, the basic point is Paul's defending God, saying he is saving all of God's, Abraham's children. It's those who believe as Abraham believed, he's going to save them all. They are truly Abraham's children. Hence, Isaac was a child of promise, but not Ishmael. Hence, Jacob was a child of the promise, but not Esau. So there's a division amongst the overarching uh, physical seed of the race of the Jews. Some will be saved, some will not. God's still faithful. He's keeping his word, is the point. And he says here, He can have mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens the heart of whomever he wills. Who can say to God, what doest thou, said Nebuchadnezzar? Who can stay his hands? The Lord is in, on his throne in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases, say the scriptures. He does whatever he pleases. He can do whatever he wants. He's the king. So, he hardens the heart of whomever he wills at whatever time he wants for whatever purpose he has, which is always good and holy and just and true and right. And he can also have mercy on whomever he wills according to his own discretion and will. He's fully a free agent to do whatever he wants because he's the king. Right? And he always does what's right. For he said that to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not upon man's will or exertion but upon God's mercy. It's God doing the choosing and showing mercy and softening hearts or hardening hearts if he should so choose. And God is, he can do whatever he wants. And he has purposes and good purposes and all these things. But the scripture says to Pharaoh, here's one purpose of hardening the heart. I have raised you up, raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So did God have a righteous purpose in showing that? Yes. Was God unjust in hardening Pharaoh's heart? He's not only free to do whatever he wants, but also Pharaoh is an evil person. Does God harden the hearts of people after he rejects them at times in Scripture? Yeah. Be careful lest you harden your heart as in the days of the rebellion, it says in the Hebrews. Beware about lest your heart be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have to guard our own hearts that they not be hardened. But God is also can do whatever he wants, harden or soften. But we have to guard our own hearts lest they be hardened. We can harden them and soften them too. You're in the right place to soften them because we're hearing the word of God. This is what keeps things oily, you know, like malleable. It's like Play-Doh. You guys, are, we're all like Play-Doh. What do you do with Play-Doh? You can shape it anywhere you want and then you put it back in and you keep it there in the airtight little seal and you can play with it as long as you want. Very moldable. What happens if you leave Play-Doh out and you don't do anything with it, sit it out in the air, it becomes like a rock. Do nothing with it. It's hardened itself. So we want to be like Plato. Through the Word of God. Did I even know I was going to say that tonight? I had no idea. This came to me. Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. Yes, so, it's through the Word of God. So hard preaching softens hearts. Yes, true. That's true. And we need to have hard and soft preaching depending on where the person's heart is. So there's the law, hardened heart, or soft with the gospel, and... It's all going to be, you know, it's beautiful. So we're in the right place to say malleable and soft. But we still need to be on guard. And, and God's softening our hearts at the same time. So, but he, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, who was already evil. Oh, by the way, here's the parable Jesus told. He says, you know, a king, well, this is, there's a, <laughs> a man made a great feast for his son, right? And he invited many. 
And he said, come and enjoy the feast. All is ready. I've, I've, killed the fatty, I've killed the calf or whatever it is. I forget the exact words. Come. And what do they do? They all begin to make excuses. Oh, I've uh, got a wife, and I've got, or I've got a yoke of oxen, or I've got the field, and I've got to go do these things. Pray have me excused. Well, what's the, what's the, was it the king, was it, or the man who made the feast said, who was angry, he says, go, go, go out quickly. Now, everything's ready here, but those who were invited were not worthy. The Jews, in that case, in that story, they go out to the hedges and they gather people from the highways and the hall is filled with guests and all these things. I think I'm blending two parables here. But, but then the king said, none of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. What is that? Hardening. After what? Rejection. Refusal. <clears throat> when they rejected him and he gave, and actually he gives many invitations, eventually God could say, okay, that's it, you're hardened. I'm going to harden you in that. You're not going to taste my banquet because you rejected it when I offered it to you. Just that, now, if you're a double predestination of Calvinist, you're going to have to say God was never wanted them to come to his banquet. He said, come to my feast. All is now ready. Come, please, come. It's here. With his fingers crossed behind his back, and he didn't really mean it because ah, I never wanted you here anyway. I just said that in order I could double damn you. Is that God? No. 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 He sincerely was calling them. Jesus says, How often I will, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as I hadn't gathered you through under her wings, and you would not. In other words, you refused. How often I wanted to and wished to, but you said no. All day long, he's going to say in Revelation 10, sorry, Romans 10, all day long I've held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary, contrary people. God says at times in the Old Testament, oh, I had wished, I had hoped that you would do this. I would have done this for you. I would have set you on high. But now I will do this to you. Because he rejected me. He's like a, a husband who's calling his wife back, etc. So, when people reject, God can then harden. So, today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart today if you hear it. Don't harden your heart as in the day of the rebellion. One other example, before we go on, is... Whatever their example <laughs> is, um, is 2 Thessalonians 2 of the deception of the end times. Therefore, God sends upon them a strong delusion in the end times to make them believe what is false because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. A strong delusion is hardening. Why? Because they refused to love the truth when He preached it to them. And so be saved, and because they did that, therefore the strong delusion comes, and he hardens them in their rejection of him, that he, they would never come and taste of his banquet. Right? So beware of that. So God can do whatever he wants. In this case, why does, what's the good thing about hardening Pharaoh's heart? It's actually, God's always working righteously, righteously by the way, whether he hardens or softens. Glorifies God, yes. Glorifies God, exactly. I've raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you so that my name may be proclaimed, be proclaimed in all the earth. So this is going to be to my fame and glory that everybody on the earth may know that I am God. That you, who think you're a God, Pharaoh, and you think you have all power and you're the king of the world and everything, I will put you in your place. And everybody's going to know that the Lord is king and not you. And I'm going to show my power. Even your magicians, your sorcerers will come and try to imitate me. And I always liking it to, you know, they're making, you know, a little paper airplane and going, look, what we can do with our magic arts. And God is just an F-16 on the carrier deck of the, of the aircraft carrier and go, yeah, you think that's a good airplane? You know, take off and burn everything up because uh, all, the, all the might of man is as nothing in God's sight. So, that was a good hardening of the heart. It shows God's power. God shows his wrath against sin. And his name, therefore, would be glorified. And all the earth would know, wow, that's, that's God. In fact, when they got to Canaan, remember what happened with uh, Rahab in Jericho? She's like, you know, Israel wasn't even believing in God, as they should have been. But all Jericho was like, Rahab's like, we are trembling here. Every man's heart has melted like like 
snow or melted in fear before you because we heard what your God did to the Egyptians. So we're in big doo-doo. There's no way we can stand before this God. Isn't that funny that Israel, who should have believed, didn't? And here the unbelievers, at least recognizing God's power, His might, His name is proclaimed in all the earth, and they're believing in, in great dread. Yeah. So He's going to show the power. He's going to make His name great. So then He has mercy on whomever He wills, and He hardens the heart of whomever He wills. Remembering that the overall question there, again, is what? <clears throat> well, is God unjust since He's not saving all of Israel? Physical Israel? No, he's perfectly just to save some out of Israel and some out of the Gentiles and to pass and to harden some of Israel. He can harden the heart of whomever he wills. He can have mercy on whomever he wills. He's the king and do whatever he wants. He's always just. And uh, he's totally defended here. He's good. We're going to have to conclude there probably for tonight because we're going to do the Lord's Supper in just a moment. But this is all very deep stuff and it's really great. It's great stuff to understand. And uh, be thankful, too, as God's people, that he has upon you and me, by his grace and election, delighted, delighted to show us mercy. We are vessels of mercy, prepared beforehand for glory. All according to his election, for ordination, for knowledge, his work, not our good works and stuff like that, but His election and His call has chosen for you to be a vessels of mercy, children of Abraham, since you believe as He did, you're reckoned as His children, and you're inheritors with Him of the promises, which is Romans chapter 4, the world, the world, the cosmos. So these are all great things, and we'll pick up on that, we'll... Hopefully conclude with Romans 9 next week. I think we can do it since we've gotten into the meat of it there.